Thanks for tuning in to this week's news recap. Before we begin, a note on last week's news recap regarding Outlier Ventures. I reported that Web3 Accelerator had raised a funding round of $350 million, only to find out that recent podcast guest Jamie Burke was playing a well-executed April Fool's prank. All right, first headline, crypto industry leaders forge alliance to champion digital currencies. The Crypto Council for Innovation, a group consisting of Fidelity, Coinbase, Square, and Paradigm, launched on Tuesday to lobby governments and institutions on crypto-related policy. The CCI will provide extensive informational resources aiming to educate crypto participants, policymakers, and governmental bodies on the benefits of using cryptocurrencies. Gus Coldabella, chief policy officer at Paradigm and one of the CCI organizers, suggests the CCI's work quote, will require sharing insights and analysis about crypto while correcting the misperceptions that inevitably accompany a transformative new technology. The CCI's inception comes in the same week that, in a letter to shareholders, JP Morgan CEO Jamie Dimon, who infamously declared Bitcoin a fraud in 2017, included the, quote, regulatory status of cryptocurrencies as an emerging issue in the U.S., that the U.S. must deal with if it is to bounce back from the economic fallout from COVID-19. Regulations regarding crypto remain rather complicated at the moment. For example, the SEC claims authority over most Ethereum-based tokens, while the CFTC oversees Bitcoin-adjacent assets like futures and options contracts. Next headline. Grayscale states intention to launch an ETF. Grayscale, the world's largest digital asset manager, is, quote, 100% committed to converting GBTC into an ETF, according to a Medium post published by the company. The Grayscale Bitcoin Trust was the first publicly traded Bitcoin fund launched in the United States and helped Grayscale become the first and only company to convert a Bitcoin fund into an SEC reporting company. Grayscale first applied for a Bitcoin ETF in 2016, but withdrew the filing due to an immature regulatory environment surrounding digital assets. The investment company has not submitted another ETF filing, declaring only that the regulatory environment will drive the timing of its next application. Shareholders of GPTC will see their fees go down when the fund is converted to an ETF. Meanwhile, alternative asset manager NYDIG secured another $100 million in funding just one month after announcing a $200 million round. The additional capital comes from Star Insurance and Liberty Mutual. They joined the previous round of investors, including Stone Ridge Holdings, Morgan Stanley, New York Life, Mass Mutual, and Soros Management Fund. Next headline. NFT market correction doesn't slow down the NFT craze. The NFT market seems to have corrected a bit. The average price of an NFT dropped from its February peak of $4,000 to $1,500 at the start of April, with trade volume mimicking the mountainous rise and fall of average NFT prices peaking at 80,000 weekly trades before settling at roughly 45,000 in early April. However, before you go out and sell all your NFTs, the current average price of $1,500 represents a 10x increase in the average cost of an NFT from six months ago. And NFT weekly trade volume has more than doubled compared to Q4 of 2020. As if to spite the bubble popping narrative, the NFT headlines were just as wacky as usual, if not more so. A few of the more interesting stories include Tom Brady and Peyton Manning are now fighting for NFT supremacy. Brady, the seven-time Super Bowl champion, is launching an NFT platform called Autograph, seeking to extend the idea of an autograph into the digital world. Manning, along with his brother Eli, is set to launch the Manning Legacy Collection made up of eight unique art pieces through Maker's Place on April 16th. Forbes, my former employer, dropped an NFT of its recent Winklevi profile on Nifty Gateway. The cover, depicting Cameron and Tyler Winklevoss smiling behind the title, A New Billionaire Every Day, sold for $333,333. The proceeds will go to the Committee to Protect Journalists and the International Women's Media Foundation. Two Coinbase employees decided to get married on the blockchain. The happy couple, by the way, that's the Ethereum blockchain. The happy couple exchanged NFTs in addition to the traditional swap of rings, cementing their marriage on Ethereum for all time. As if Brian Armstrong, the CEO of Coinbase, doesn't have enough going on right now. He is collaborating with DJ Davi to produce electronic music, a skill he picked up during COVID last year. The songs will be released as NFTs. 
And if you want a deeper understanding of how NFTs work or what they may become, I highly recommend this NFT canon by A16Z, a carefully curated collection of articles and resources for the NFT curious. Next headline, Ripple wins lawsuit for access to internal SEC communications on crypto. In December, the SEC announced a lawsuit against Ripple Labs, claiming that XRP was a security and that the company had raised more than $1.3 billion in unregistered offerings. On Tuesday, Ripple Labs won a discovery ruling that will require the SEC to hand over internal communications on how it determines whether a cryptocurrency is a security. The SEC does not consider Bitcoin and Ether to be securities, but has not issued any formal guidance explaining how it arrived at those conclusions. Ripple likely hopes the SEC mentions XRP as a virtual currency similar to BTC and ETH, which would help its case to be treated as a non-security. Barring a blatant mention of XRP in the same vein as Bitcoin and Ethereum, the ruling could still offer the general public its first in-depth look at how the SEC regulates crypto. Ripple Labs' token, XRP, is up nearly 20% since the report broke. Next headline. VC-backed stablecoin protocol Fay is off to a shaky start. Fay, an, al- an algorithmic stablecoin pegged to the dollar, recently concluded its Genesis event. In total, the protocol minted 1.3 billion of its Fay tokens. As a stablecoin, Fay got off to a shaky start, trading between... 5 cents and 10 cents off the targeted $1 mark for the first few days before tanking to under 80 cents on Thursday. The situation emphasizes the difficulties in creating an algorithmic stablecoin. The protocol aimed to create a stablecoin that would purchase assets outright with its token rather than holding them as collateral, like a tether. Fay is created with a trade instead of debt. However, a vulnerability in its incentive mechanism made it prohibitively expensive for users to sell in the days following the Genesis event. To enforce its peg, Fay had established a Uniswap burn penalty that penalizes traders for transacting with Fay under its $1 peg and a reway of Fay tokens on Uniswap that burns under pegged tokens, thereby increasing demand back to $1. However, eventually the penalty became so high that at times the burns would exceed 100% of a trade's value, effectively making the token worthless when attempting to sell it on Uniswap. Additionally, the team was alerted to a bug via its bug bounty program, and so it had to suspend the minting rewards that come with buying Fay, leaving only the sell disincentives. Fay currently has a market cap of $1.6 billion. Next headline, messaging app Signal to integrate cryptocurrency payment feature. Signal, an encrypted messaging app, is rolling out payments using the cryptocurrency mobile coin. Unlike WhatsApp and iMessage, which allow payments to be sent via bank accounts, Signal is looking to provide a way to send money that nobody outside the sender or recipient can track. While Zcash and Monero are the most popular cryptocurrencies with that sort of privacy capability, Signal chose mobile coins for its user experience, minimal storage requirements, and quick transaction time. In a blog post announcing the news, Signal clarified that it would not have access to user balances, transaction history, or funds. While many in the crypto community expressed excitement, there were also a few dissenting voices. Matt Corallo, a developer at Square Crypto, tweeted, There is no technical justification for Signal requiring its own blockchain in order to get the payment throughput they want. There is no reason at all for requiring the token issuance to go entirely to the small number of founders except to maximize profits. There is zero reason even to require their own token at all when this could absolutely have been built using existing cryptocurrency systems pegged to traditional fiat currencies, which would offer significantly better UX and avoid the massive value fluctuation risk that Signal is now hoisting onto its user base. Next headline, China's digital currency head start. The Wall Street Journal wrote an in-depth analysis of China's digital yuan, calling it, quote, a first for a major economy. The digital yuan launched through a mobile app that has since been downloaded over 100,000 times. The government-issued digital money money can be used to track people's spending in real time, speed relief to disaster victims, or flag criminal behavior. The article also notes, quote, The money itself is programmable. Beijing has tested expiration dates to encourage users to spend it quickly, for times when the economy needs a jumpstart. However, the Wall Street Journal adds that the digital yuan may also be used to tighten President Xi Jinping's authoritarian rule as a tracking tool, making it possible to collect fines as soon as an infraction is committed. 
The article also points out that the digital yuan could undermine the supremacy of the dollar, saying, quote, it would provide options for people in poor countries to transfer money internationally. Even limited international usage could soften the bite of U.S. sanctions, which increasingly are used against Chinese companies or individuals. Josh Lipsky, a former International Monetary Fund staffer now at the Atlanta Council, think tank, said, quote, anything that threatens the dollar is a national security issue. This threatens a dollar over the long term. The Wall Street Journal notes that a Chinese marketing campaign depicts a man in an American flag shirt being knocked out by an animated digital yuan. Conversely, PayPal co-founder Peter Thiel wondered if Bitcoin should be considered a Chinese financial weapon against the United States. His comments, especially coming from someone who considers himself a Bitcoiner, brought up vociferous opposition from crypto Twitter. As Nick Carter of Island Castle Ventures tweeted, So there's two nations. One of them has a free floating currency and permits the free flow of capital. The other has a managed currency and maintains strict capital controls. Which nation is Bitcoin more hostile to? All right, time for fun bits. Happy birthday, Satoshi. Happy 45th birthday to Satoshi, maybe. The pseudonymous Bitcoin creator celebrated his or her birthday on April 5th. On Twitter, Alex Gladstein, chief strategy officer at the Human Rights Foundation, offered some insight on why Satoshi may have chosen that particular date. He says, Satoshi listed their birthday as April 5th, 1975. If you are wondering what animated them to create Bitcoin, April 5th equals a date that Franklin Delano Roosevelt signed Order 6102, making it illegal for Americans to own gold. In 1975, Americans could legally own gold again. It's all about financial freedom. All right, thanks for tuning in. To learn more about Larry and Coinbase, be sure to check out the links in the show notes for this episode. Follow Unchained on Twitter at Unchained underscore pod, where you can find all sorts of content ranging from my weekly newsletter to updates on my upcoming book and a whole lot more. Unconfirmed is produced by me, Laura Shin, with help from Anthony Yoon, Mark Murdoch, Daniel Ness. Thanks for listening.